Well, this is certainly not how I intended to give this sermon, but I am thankful for the technology that allows me to deliver the sermon that I wrote this past Wednesday, and I am also thankful for Father Tom's leadership and presence with you all who are in the church today and watching on the live stream. Let us pray. God of all things, may only your truth be spoken, and only your truth be heard, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm not sure why exactly, but this story of Jesus at the wedding in Cana is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. Maybe it's because, at least in my mind, it's a story that clearly points to the fact that all shall be well. It's also a fitting text as we continue a sermon series on these Sundays after the Epiphany about baptism. In the example of the empty water jars being filled with excellent wine, we see God's transforming grace. And what God did with that wine is but a glimpse of the transformation that God has in store for us all. Now, to grasp what John is telling us through this narrative, we have to skip to the end before we get to the beginning. The last verse we heard this morning reads, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. John does not call this a miracle, but rather a sign, and the difference is significant. A miracle, certainly, it's amazing. And sure, maybe a miracle would show the power of the miracle worker. But a miracle is just a one-time event. A sign is something different. A sign points us towards something beyond itself. What happened at Cana was more than a miracle. It was a sign pointing to the transforming grace of God. As the inaugural song, this one establishes the trajectory of the grace and glory of God in Christ that is to be revealed and received. What does it mean that this is the first sign that Jesus gives us? Well, for one, we can't overlook the fact that it happens at a party. People who think that God is angry judgmental, overbearing, or exacting, have completely missed the point. God, quite literally, is the life of the party, and the party has started. The joy and peace that God desires for us is not something reserved for us after death, as if that wasn't clear enough in the prayer that Jesus taught us, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The fact that this first sign happens at a wedding banquet is a clear sign that the abundant and flourishing life has already begun in Christ. Baptism is our entrance into the great party, and it prepares us to receive and to grow in the new life of grace, which is a sign, indeed, that the kingdom is coming on earth as it is already in heaven. But then there's a crisis. They have no wine. Now, this is not about getting drunk, but it's a social problem. Weddings in that time and place were not one-day extravaganzas. Rather, the party would last for a week or so. And so to run out of wine would bring shame upon the host family. And for a culture that was much more clan-based and honor-based than ours, this spelled an impending disaster. So Mary comes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now for you, maybe the crisis is different. We don't have enough money to pay the bills. There is no cure. He has no hope. She has no friends. I have no more strength. Whatever it is that you are in short supply of, 
God knows it, and God will provide it. Now, what's so fascinating about this incident is that the hosts likely have no idea that they are running out of wine. They're probably talking with the guests and having a good time. Now, the steward of the party, he knows that they're getting low on wine, and Mary learns of it, and then she tells Jesus, it's a good reminder, when you are facing a problem, don't forget to tell Jesus about it. And when the steward tells the groom that the good wine was coming out, we're not told that in any way that he's surprised by this. What I am saying, beloved, is that sometimes God saves us from dangers we weren't even aware of. Perhaps God has already saved you from the mistake you never got around to making. Maybe God has already given you what you were too busy to notice that you had run out of. Think about an experience that many of us have all the time, right? We, we arrive at our destination with no real memory of all the stops and turns that we took along the way. Well, it's the same thing in life. And just because we are not paying attention, it doesn't mean that God is not there taking care of us in ways that we will never know about. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be the groom at this reception? All of a sudden, the head waiter comes up to you and applauds you for the quality of the wine that you have provided for your guests. Goodness, I've never known a family to provide silver oak for the wedding reception. But you know that in truth, you bought yellowtail. Now, if you're not a wine drinker, that means that you're given credit for providing the top tier stuff when you know that you bought from the bargain bin. Now, the groom is oblivious to what has happened, but his reputation is about to go up, even though he has done nothing to deserve it. Beloved, we all have things to be proud of. To be sure, over in my office there are diplomas and certificates and awards in my office. And yes, I am proud of those things. But I would be a fool if I thought that they were about me. It is God who got me through those exams and papers. It is God who gave me the opportunities to succeed. It is God who picked me up when I fell, often picking me up out of sight of others so that they didn't even see the stumble. This sign at Cana is a reminder to us that the great things that we get credit for are the work of God. So we ought to always be humble in our accomplishments and ready to give God thanks, even for the things we don't know about. God provides for us in ways that we are completely unaware of. Now, the steward likely assumed that the groom just had more wine in storage and had told the servers to bring it out of that storage. Now, that wasn't true for the groom's family. There was no cellar full of wine. There was nothing in storage. But just because our tank is empty, it doesn't mean that God's is. God has things in storage that we don't know about. As we heard in the reading from 1 Corinthians, now there are a varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And then gifts like wisdom, healing, prophecy, and discernment are mentioned. God has things and people in store, all over the place, just waiting to bring out into service when the time is right. This weekend, our nation remembers one such gift pulled out of God's storehouse the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. When our nation needed a voice of moral courage to remind us of God's dream of beloved community, King was called upon. Now, King, as a preacher of the gospel, he knew that he was merely the messenger. King's legacy is not perfect. His life is not beyond reproach. He was not the Messiah, but that doesn't matter because we already have a Messiah in Jesus, and King knew that. In one speech called The Drum Major Instinct, King said, I want to be at Jesus' side in love and justice so that we can make the old world a new world. 
King reminds us that love and justice are God's work. And though we are given the gift of working alongside God, it is always God who brings the transforming grace. Yes, we are baptized with a bit of water, and from there, God's grace through us will do far more than we can ask or imagine. And sometimes the best we can do is to bring some water. We don't have the grapes, the yeast, or the sugar to make any wine, but somehow God always seems to get the needed wine. But maybe you don't even have that much. Maybe right now it's easier to identify with the empty jars, that, and you don't even have enough water to fill those. Well, that's quite all right. Because remember, God created out of nothing, and so if nothing is all you've got, God Almighty can do amazing things with that. Maybe we can only put in a little bit, but God can work wonders with even that much. Perhaps it's just an hour that you can give to volunteer. Maybe a small amount of money that you can give. It could be just five minutes a day to read scripture or be in prayer. But look out now. God will get to work with it. And the result of Jesus' intervention is six full stone jars of wine. That comes out to about 800 bottles of wine. Now, Cana was a small village with an adult population nowhere near 800. So the bottle-to-person ratio is quite high. And this wine impressed the chief steward, who presumably had tasted a fair amount of wine. Not only does God provide the good stuff, but God provides a lot of it. If you'll allow me the point of a personal privilege, I want to talk about how I have received the good stuff from you all. Today, January 16th, is the anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood. Twelve years ago today, I was ordained as a priest at the Washington National Cathedral, and I am so incredibly thankful for that. Goodness knows, God has certainly transformed water into wine throughout my ministry. And in this calling, God has blessed me with the really good stuff. Now, you all know that this pandemic has been hard on everyone. Now, there's no competition for who's had it worse. But this pandemic has been really difficult on clergy. Many, many clergy have walked away from ministry or have considered it. Now sure, I have had some days that have been harder than any I experienced before the pandemic began, but all things considered, I really am quite good. Now there's a couple of reasons for this. One, when it comes to prayer, I have the gift of discipline. And so my well was not running dry before March 2020. I'm also blessed to have a supportive and understanding family. And as you all know, with every fiber of my being, I absolutely believe that all shall be well with God. But a huge part of the reason why, on this ordination anniversary, I am as grateful and as hopeful as ever is because of you, the good people of St. Luke's. This parish is simply amazing. One part of our parish identity statement is that this is a place to come and see the abundant grace of God. Now, maybe I'm the one to put the label on that, but I did not create it. God working through you has made this into a place of abundant grace. The credit belongs to you for that, of course, working with God. Now, I've got story after story after story from colleagues in ministry, both here in Salisbury and around our diocese, who have had their decisions scrutinized, their motivations questioned, their leadership undermined, and their actions vilified over the past two years of this pandemic. Sure, I know, we are all tired of masks, so am I. 
But do you know how many times people have yelled at me about masks? Zero. Do you know how many times I have been accused to my face or heard about it, of being accused of poor leadership throughout this pandemic? Zero. And that is not because I am perfect, far from it. It's because this parish knows how to keep the main thing the main thing. The love of God in Christ. Thank you for that. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Truly, you all are a blessing. You are the good stuff. And I don't know how I could have gotten through this pandemic without you all. Now, the Finance Committee doesn't meet until tomorrow, so the numbers might change a little bit as we review the year-end reports. But you all know 2021 had a negative $22,000 budget because we knew that 2021 was not going to be a normal year. Now, I really do not like deficit budgets, but it's what we thought we needed to do to keep everything running smoothly in the difficulty of a pandemic. But do you know how the year ended up? Thanks to our staff keeping expenses in line and being diligent stewards of our budget, and because of your generous support, we ended 2021 with a surplus of nearly $35,000. And the budget for 2022, it looks like we're going to be able to give the staff cost of living adjustments and have the director of music ministry position increased full time with a good salary and having the balanced budget while at the same time not decreasing any of our spending on ministries while also increasing how much we will be giving for mission and outreach. Now to be clear, it's not about the money. It's about the fact that we are all committed to coming and seeing the difference that Christ makes. God's transforming grace is clearly present here, and that makes this such an exciting and invigorating place to serve and to worship. Serving as the rector of such an amazing parish really does feel like I get to drink from the good stuff made possible by God's grace through you. Now, I think that perhaps the most amazing part of this story about the wedding at Cana is that there was so much good wine produced that it never ran out. In fact, I don't know if you knew this, but the wine that Jesus transformed at Cana it's still available today. By God's grace, that good wine that is a sign of the kingdom's coming on earth as it is in heaven is given to us Sunday after Sunday by the power of the Holy Spirit in the Eucharist. On this ordination anniversary, even if I have to wait one more week to stand at the altar again, it remains my sheer joy and honor to break the bread and to lift the cup as we are all nourished by God's grace. Therefore, let us keep the feast.